I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Leon Marr. I work for the Open Society Foundations, uh, specifically for the Human Rights Initiative. Uh, my program is responsible for uh, our disability rights uh, portfolio, and I'm happy to welcome you to tonight's discussion. Um, what we're going to be doing tonight is uh, uh, having a discussion that is not legal. It's not going to be policy oriented. We thought that we would have uh, one session uh, during this gathering that would actually look at uh, more a cultural side of um, things uh, in terms of representations of people with albinism. Um, and I think what we're going to discuss in the next little while is how different uh, projects are uh, aiming to change perceptions of uh, albinism and uh, uh, people with albinism. So I'm happy to um, welcome uh, the panelists tonight. Uh, I'll introduce them uh, from your left to right, starting with uh, Tando Hopa, who uh, I think many of you know and have heard uh, speak uh, already earlier uh, yesterday, for those of you who were here. Uh, next to Tando is Isaac M Mora, and uh, Isaac, definitely you know him because he's been moderating, moderating some of the sessions earlier today. Uh, next to Isaac, I am pleased to welcome uh, Ms. Cora Porte. She is a photographer who will be presenting to us uh, some of her projects on uh, persons with albinism. And next to Cora is uh, Gloria Taruvinga, and uh, Gloria was one of the subjects uh, and one of the participants in uh, one of Cora's photography projects. So um, I'm happy to uh, give the floor to uh, some of our uh, panelists. We'll hear and see uh, about some of their projects. And what I really want to do is encourage all of you to uh, uh, make this session quite interactive and ask questions or share any thoughts that you might have uh, as we actually present uh, the work of uh, uh, these people. And uh, we'll start off with uh, Cora Porte. Um, and uh, I'll leave the floor to you, Cora. So, okay, <laughs> okay. So, um, good evening. So, you already introduced um, myself. I apologize for my English also. I do have a very strong French accent, so I'm sorry for that. Um, first of all, I would like to say that it's actually wonderful to see people involved um, in, the, um, in the discussion and to see that, you know, sometimes when you are doing projects, um, you can feel very um, alone <laughs> in, your, in your project and to see that there is people actually who, who, are, who are there and who are, <coughs> how do you say? Yeah, who are there and who are also involved in the topic is something I think very important for me. Um, so, I actually did two different projects. Um, the first one was in Senegal, so I also come, uh, my father is Senegalese actually, so I did my first photographic project in Senegal in 2014. And it was uh, um, with a journalistic approach. So it was exploring um, access to education for children living with albinism in the region of Tambacounda, which is a very, um, it's one of the hottest region in Senegal. So um, it was actually, um, I can say it was a very difficult experience for me. And I saw um, things that actually, <laughs> it's gonna mark me for, my, for, for the rest of my life. Um, but yeah. And so I did the second project here in Johannesburg in South Africa. So my question was, um, you know, is, it's still the same continent, it's Africa, and how do people uh, living with albinism can also live differently? Um, um, depends of the country, depends of the, of the culture, depends of the tradition, depends of the, of the, um, the environment and all of that. So. Um, I think we should have a look at the project. So this one is the, is the second one that I did with Gloria. And so I think after showing you the images, she will maybe speak about 
um, the experience for her and how was it to be um, part of the project. So maybe I, I will ask Gloria if she wants to come and and to speak about the <laughs> the experience. Uh, good evening, wonderful ladies and gentlemen. I'm Gloria. So um, as I experienced the project with Cora, I found that myself, you know, feeling free, feeling, you know, just we went out, we had a conversation, we had actually we managed to create a relationship between us. Why I'm saying we managed to create a relationship is uh, most of the people, when they see albini albinos, they, are, they tend to call them names, they tend to give them, I don't know, I don't know how they, they, they create it. Maybe they, saw, they see us not as human beings. Some of, you, some of the people, they, they even don't want to talk to you or maybe you're trying to like, I don't know, you're in a taxi, and then you sit next to them. They don't feel comfortable. They don't feel like they're sitting next to a human being. So with this project, I uh, managed to end a friendship, relationship, and we, we, I managed to go out. Like, I felt like I had a sister besides me because never uh, in such a long time had I had that great time. We had ideas. We talked about life. We, let me tell you one thing, why I felt so much like this. When, uh, when I was born, my only father, she, he divorced my mommy because of my skin. He said, this is not, a bab this is not my, my child. So in my own, when I was growing up, I was thinking, so am I not a human being enough? Am I a taboo? Am I what? Because when, when I also went to school, the same thing happened. They were calling me names. They were, you know, stigmatization went on and on and on. So because of this project, I realized, no, I'm a human being. I'm just like any other person. I can have friends. I can do whatever they do. I can go wherever I go. I can, you know, this is a free world. But the society, I think it needs to be told about who is an albino. What is it that's going on? Because I don't see a difference between you and me, ladies and gentlemen. Because what I wonder is that when people see a white man, they don't tend to call names or like they don't seem marveled. When they see Indians, they don't get marveled. But the, when they see the albino, they just call names, they just do all sorts of things. But to my, to my question is, what is the real difference, me and you, you see? So this project, uh, I guess it will go around and change people's lives and turn it into a better thing and stop the stigmatization. People, they need to be told, they, they need to know the society, they need at large, they need to understand what is our business. Because what I see is just a different skin. Whatever I have, you guys have it, you see. So people, they really need to stop this thing. Even in schools, we need to educate our children who is an albino, what is it, because that one who, who, who gave birth to an albino, maybe he didn't want to, but it's because that's how it's supposed to be. That's how it is. I can't change myself. I can't, you know, that's who I am. So you need to take me as I am. You need to appreciate me in the society. You need to, you know, you need to welcome me the way I am. 
I don't see any difference. The only difference that I have is the skin, you see. So we need to educate the people. We need to, at first I didn't want to, when she approached me to have the, the project, I didn't want to talk to her because I thought maybe she's one of those people. You know, people are having all cultures. They're taking people. I actually have, um, where I'm staying, a neighbor. They have an albino boy. She, he's two years old. So this guy, when, whenever they're walking, it's three times the, 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 the robbers, they come with guns pointing at them. Give us that child or else you will die. What do, what do they want to use that child for? They want to use for rituals. They want to use to make business. You can't make business with somebody's blood. You can't be rich with somebody else. It's not, it's not because, you know, if you kill me, it doesn't mean that you're going to have the business on and on and on. That's, that's, it doesn't make sense because what's dif what, do the, what difference do we have? It's only the skin, you see? So what I'm trying to say is, guys, let's stop the stigmatization. Let's appreciate each other. Let's learn who we are. Let's, you know, Take me as I am. Don't think that maybe I'm a taboo, maybe I'm something else. I'm not an animal, I'm just a human being just as you are. So I think you guys, when you go out there, when you go back to your offices, to your societies, to your home, tell your neighbor that an albino is just a person like you. An albino is just a human being. The only difference is the skin. We all have hearts, we all have bodies, we all breathe the same thing. We all die the same. So when you go out there, teach them about us. And you yourself, don't make yourself inferior. If you see me, you try to run away, or you try to show me that I, I can't stand near you, or you, you are different from me. You see, you don't have to do that. What you have to do to us is you show love to us, because I've never had a... Uh, of a situation whereby albino were taking, albinos were taking people to all counties or whereby albinos were um, abusing people. But it's other people who tend to abuse us. And that's not a good thing. So we need to learn as people. We, lead, we at large, uh, thank God that all of you are here. You are going, you, you, you are going out there to tell them who we are. You are going to tell them what they need to do. We, you are going to tell them not to separate themselves, or not even to call us with names. We are just people. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, now I'm just going to go very fast to the second project. Is the first one that I actually did, and. You will see that um, it's very different, and because this one is very um, much more dynamic and much more um, urban, I will say, and the one that I did in Senegal is um, yeah completely different. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Cora. Um, I know that Tando has to leave us very soon, so I wanted to um, bring her into the conversation. Uh, Tando and I uh, were working uh, earlier today on a film that Open Society is doing on albinism, and part of our conversation involved um, I images in popular culture and the lack of uh, diversity, uh, especially the lack of involvement of persons uh, with albinism. And I'm wondering, Tando, if you um, can maybe comment on the kinds of uh, photography projects like the one that Cora just showed us and um, give us your thoughts on uh, what the, I guess, um, considerations are uh, in producing images of persons with albinism and the, uh, you know, what kind of considerations need to be uh, thought of in terms of uh, the, the subjects, persons with albinism, stereotypes and not wanting to um, uh, reinforce stereotypes or present uh, uh, persons with al albinism uh, as victims, those kinds of pitfalls, I guess, that uh, often come with um, um, creating imagery. Hello, everybody, again. Um, okay. I'm going, to, I'm going to give you a very personal experience. Very, very personal. Um, when I started in this industry, I was confronted with so many images of strife, of suffering when it came to albinism. And I wanted to present an alternative image. Now, the issue about that, well, firstly, let me start here. People will tell you that you don't have an accessible look, all right? And my issue was I really wanted to have an option of how I want to look. If I want to keep my hair the way it is, I don't want you to tell me that it's a unique kind of African that people cannot digest. Or if I don't want to color my eyebrows or my, my eyelashes, it's a choice. When I do, I do because I want to do it, it's a choice. When I don't, I don't because I want to do it, it's a choice and there needs to be a representation of different kinds of images because as much as I can put on makeup and look all dolled up, that's not how I could look when I was 10 years old or 12 years old or 14 years old, you know? And I feel like there needs to be more of a representation when it comes to different kinds of images even within albinism. Um, I think part of the issues that I had is you do want to represent albinism, you do want to talk about it, but at the same time, you don't want to be compartmentalized, uh, so much so that other facets of you aren't allowed to come out, and that is the issue of integration, you know? But there's always that dynamic that is going on, because you don't want to feel like you have to not present it, not talk about it, because you feel very strongly about it and you want to talk about it. But when you do, then you get compartmentalized and almost imprisoned by it, you know? Um, so I think in, in the industry, that there's always that, that thing to consider with regard to, do you want to stick to a particular image to, in, to such a point that it can't, you can't move out of it? But if you do that at the same time, or if you don't do that at the same time, then you really don't want to ignore issues that, that are there. Um, I think, you know, me being a model who's got albinism, a lot of the time when I had to do interviews, I had to be extremely vulnerable because I had to talk about very personal experiences. And I think the best thing to do is, as much as I could talk on stage and um, have that image of this woman who is a lawyer, who is a model, who also has albinism and talk about albinism. We need to also allow a level of integration where you 
can be put in spaces where you talk about other things. So people do understand that there are relatable facets to you in order to also normalize the image. Um, so I think that's the real dynamic between um, just integration and also specifically talking about the image. Um, I'll just tell you one story. There's a story that they, the, a film, which I can't really disclose much about um, because it's not made yet. And they said, you know, we want to do a movie about this lady who's got albinism. And they talked about so much. I mean, the narrative was so much about her being bullied and her, her community wanting to take uh, her, her body parts, etc. And I said, all right. And I said to the director, I'm like, what's her friend's name? And he's like, what? I'm like, what's her friend's name? Like, tell me in the story, what's her friend's name? What are, his, what are uh, her aspirations? What does she want to do after school? And he's like, uh, uh, well, you know, we didn't, and I'm like, you didn't humanize the story. That's what happened. You didn't humanize the story. Um, you didn't make her relatable. You made her, you exacerbated the otherness in her. Instead of looking at things that when people so see a human story and then you bring in this violence, they can relate because they, they can say, but she wanted to be a police officer after that. But she had a boyfriend who loved her and she had this cousin who she told her first secret to. All of these stories that humanize and that is the power of film and that is the power of image. You have so much at your disposal in terms of storytelling. And I think it's something that we really need to intellectualize. We can't just do without intellectualizing. Anyway, I think that's all I can say. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tando. And I know you need to go, so thank you so much for staying with us. And I think that what um, I'll try to do uh, in a few minutes after we hear from Isaac is it would be great to um, get some questions from the audience. And uh, I, I think it would be really interesting uh, to uh, hear what people, what stories people uh, thought Cora's two projects were actually telling and to get some feedback from the audience and that, on that and to hear from Cora and f from Gloria to see if that's uh, actually the stories that they were intending to tell. Um, Isaac, would you like to uh, take the floor and maybe talk a bit about the project that you've been involved with? Good evening. Yeah, just say hi to your friend and tell, tell, tell him, I am a person with albinism. <laughs> now you see, now you see, some people don't want to say that. Or do you want to say I'm an albino? Oh no, I'm sure you don't want to do that. So, are we starting with the video? Ah. so um, when I was growing up, um, and in the dating scenes, I realized something very interesting. That the girls that I came across, found it very difficult to say that I am handsome. They say, oh, you, are, you look good, you look nice, but they would not say I am handsome. And I also realized that, hey, I would see girls with albinism and I thought they were beautiful, but nobody would tell them they were beautiful. And I said to myself, really? This is something that we need to look at. It is because of such issues and looking at the vicious cycle of single parenthood whereby, like myself, my father left because I have albinism and it is a story of so many. In fact, under the albinism sort of Kenya, you could say 70% if not more of people are from single parent backgrounds, the members. And then our girls, when they grow up, they get people who give them children, but they don't marry them. So it becomes a vicious cycle. And so therefore, to find the word albinism, handsome and beautiful in the same sentence, it becomes, beautiful. It becomes difficult. And that's the reason why, after a lot of thinking, I thought, why don't we have a Mr. and Miss Albinism? So that we can redefine that narrative so that we can you know, present a new, a new image of ourselves. It is because of this that we mobilize resources and we were able to have 
the first ever Mr. and Miss Albinism in the whole world on the 21st of October last month. And uh, it, it, it's an event that really has been covered the whole world over, over 194 outlets. And it has had a huge impact in Kenya. People are talking about it. I am very, very surprised by the comment of one lady who was participating. She said, I know I'm beautiful in the bedroom, but when I get out, I am not sure. And that, that, that's, that's the story of many people with albinism. And after the event, they tell me now they are, they are to, they are, the people are running towards them. They're not running away from them. They become celebrities in their own rights. That is a transformation. People can talk about it. Now we are having corporates who want to come and join in. It was difficult to raise the resources. $30,000 is what it cost us. But now people want to come and partner with us. I have received a request from as far as Gabon. In fact, the person who inboxed on social media is a lady, a fifth year medical student. She sent me photos of a guy who she thought would, be, would qualify to be a model. But after we, as we continued to discuss and everything, I actually realized uh, he was the boyfriend, but she never wanted to say. And then she asked me, are you married? So I sent, I sent her uh, photos of my wedding and everything, and that is, she became more confident, and she now accepted that was actually the boyfriend. So it's changing perceptions, and that is what we want to do. So I would indulge us to watch uh, some video for about three minutes. We can dim the lights, and then we see some few photos, then we can have a discussion. Thank you. often face stigma, alienation, and even physical abuse. It's about challenging stigma discrimination for persons without medicine. It's never happened anywhere in the world because people without medicine are not seen to be beautiful or handsome. So it's very rare to find those two words in the same sentence. And we want to show our talent. We want to confront stigma and discrimination. We want to change our narrative. We want to show that actually, yes, it is possible uh, to have people without medicine who are beautiful, who are confident, who can do it. The models were chosen in a countrywide selection process and were put through a boot camp and taught how to walk and put on a show. They love, first of all, that they're beautiful, they're handsome, we can love, we can talk. I don't have to talk usually, but you know, we try. And uh, we can do what we are perceived not to do, you know. Albinism is a genetic condition that results in a reduction of pigment in the hair, skin, and eyes. Many grow up with a lot of challenges, but this pageant has worked wonders for the contestants' self-confidence. This event means a lot to me, as a person with albinism, especially a person who has passed a lot uh, in her years, uh, difficulties. So it means a lot to me because another opportunity that you're given to express yourself through actions and speaking and to be a role model to the other young girls and boys who are watching us. Taking part in this competition means a lot since it's, it creates awareness to both the people and the nation. So that everyone can understand that we are of no different in many parts of Africa, albinos are kidnapped and their body parts hacked off for use as charms and magical potions. The world suffers a lot, not because of the violence of bad people, but because of the silence of good people.
what such a tax already in Kenya is to initiatives like this one that can slowly change the negative perceptions and promote beauty beyond the skin. To Shabalana CCTV. So that's the guy, maybe for those who did not see clearly, that's our deputy president. He was a chief guest. Um, we had 20 participants, 10 male and 10 female, from across the country. As you can see from that image, you can leave the lights a bit. Um, so you can see these beautiful girls with our beds and wearing the African attire, you know, looking very you know, gorgeous. Um, okay. And, and maybe go back to the image. Um, if you see that lady, the girl, the, the first image. Sorry. Yeah, okay, so the first image, sorry, this, we're having some technical issues here. The first image, the lady who was in the middle, she's actually gotten now a contract with a, with a company from Paris to do high fashion. This is, this is a girl actually, and she also happened to, she came and we gave her an internship at the Albini Lip Society of Kenya. Now she can do high fashion, I think she's starting next year. Um, this is a gentleman called John. He had done some photo shoots of wanting to be Big Brother Africa. He's never participated uh, in any uh, beauty pageantry. And he was a, uh, the first runner up in male. And he's very, very happy. In fact, he says now he can even train uh, people with our business. You can see his creation. That, that what you're seeing is you know, creation, creative attire using toilet uh, tissue paper left, leftovers. Uh, it was even in the newspaper, you know. Next. Um, you see now the creativity using balloons. You know, that's the same girl I talk about. Next. Yeah, and now that's Jairus. Jairus um, is, 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 is a Mr. Albinism. He's only 20 years old. He's a music student. So we were able to see a lot of talent in terms of music, aspirations to be policemen, for example. We don't have policemen with our business. You know, the issues of to do with people think that we contaminate food. So you, want, you could see some lady there, you know, showing that he can be a chef. You know, others playing baseball, others doing I, uh, skate, skateboarding. You know, things that you think people with business will not do. And it was extremely, extremely uh, eye-opening. It has made people to appreciate people with business. And we need to do more. In fact, I was telling my good uh, sister, Ike, that we need to do a regional one now. We need to have a Mr. and Mrs. Albinism Africa, you see, where countries can participate. Because through this, now we are going to do a photo book project where we sell the photos and the proceeds go back to the society. Through this, interestingly, I think from uh, Kelly, the, 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 the story from Panama, people with albinism kind of tend to sing very well. Sometimes I think it's because some of us went to blind school, I don't know. But when we were having the boot camp, we realized our contestants could sing very well, the finalists, and now we are also going to produce a song that they are going to do. Um, and at the same time, we, 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 we have had an opportunity uh, to get training with Toyota Kenya for them to improve on their self-image and entrepreneurial skills, you know, those kind of things. So new partnerships coming on board. And what, one, of the no one of the innovations of this uh, contest, or this event initiative, is bringing on board the private sector, you know, so that they can contribute to these perceptions, uh, change of perceptions. And we've also had offers now, much as we had the programs, like the biggest uh, uh, electricity generating company has said we can have some two or three uh, people going for internship, they may even take one or two for employment. So those new partnerships uh, and changing the, the And of course, the fact that the deputy president came on board means that there was that endorsement, that political, you know, political endorsement. Uh, and, and, and I think it's, it's very, very important to do such kind of things. Not just showing the, the sorry stories of skin cancer, of ritual killings, or people suffering in some uh, DJ places. We've got to show that we've got something different. And we hope and believe that the more we show this, the more we keep on showing uh, beautiful women, then also our women will get married. Then men also will, yeah. Then our men will not be asked questions whether they can have children who don't have albinism, as if it's a curse to have one with albinism. So this is what we want to achieve through changing perceptions and narratives. Thank you very much. I 
I'm happy to open uh, the floor to questions if anyone has questions for any of our panelists. Sure. A good evening to you all. Uh, my name is Juventus. I'm from Ghana. I have a question for Mr. Isaac. If I heard you right, you said that when you were born, your, as with Abinism, your father left. Now that you have grown, you have become an MP. I want to ask you, so how would your father feel now now that you have become an important person. And also, how are you able to influence people to accept uh, albinism? Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Chair. Um, the first question, Chair, goes to the, uh, I want to find out from the first presenter who did some work in Senegal and did some work in South Africa. I wanted to hear from her um, what remarkable differences did she notice in terms of uh, uh, cultural attitude towards people with albinism in Senegal, which is a predominantly an Islamic country, and in South Africa, which is predominantly a Christian country. That is one. Secondly, I really wanted to to ask this question to Isaac, I should have asked him a long time ago, but I think we kept missing each other. Maybe when I'm looking elsewhere, he has passed, so uh, I will take this opportunity to find out. You talked about earlier, you talked about statistics in Kenya, that you managed to convince the Central Statistics Office uh, to include uh, the issues of albinism in, in, in the statistics. And uh, I wanted to find out how many people with albinism have you managed to identify in Kenya? And how can you help us in other countries uh, bring on board uh, such an idea? Because I think this is one of the areas we have a challenge to have the exact numbers of people with albinism and even people with disabilities. Thank you so much. All right, uh, thank you, Honorable Isaac. I think I'm going to ask for a few contacts off the mic for some of the models, because hey, you've got beautiful models that side. But my, <laughs> I, I am, I'm Brian and I'm from Zimbabwe, and I just wanted to ask, I just wanted to compliment you on the, on the, on the modeling pageant. I just wanted to make mention of the fact that you have really, really created quite a resource for, for your foundation. Those people, the confidence that has been shown even from the, from the short video clip shows how much um, you have improved their lives. So my question, my follow-up question on that is if there are any sustainable plans that you are making of using the same resource that you have created to create confidence in the rest of the albino community. Because having been um, working with the, with, with the albino community, I've noticed that a lot of people really lack in confidence. So if they've got mentors like the ones that we've seen here, if they've got icons to look at, uh, I'm sure that a lot of things can be done. They can also, a lot of the people in the community can also benefit. So do you have any plans of maybe having them become mentors of maybe people with albinism in schools or any, any, any other person in the rest of the albino community in Kenya? That's my question. I just, <clears throat> I, I, first, uh, I, uh, Honorable Isaac, I, I want to congratulate you. Um, congratulations for uh, the, uh, you know, the project uh, that you embarked on. And um, also uh, continue in terms of uh, sustainability, you know. Uh, for the young woman, uh, I'm very much uh, interested in... Um, what you do and, and what you intend to do. Uh, I would say to all of us that um, don't be a cheap copy of the original. Don't be a cheap copy of the original. Be yourself. You know, sometimes we, we want to show to the colored people that we are white people. We're not. Be 
yourself. You know, you don't have to talk to you don't have to talk like a white man to be accepted. Just be yourself. Once you're authentic, you'll grow in confidence. You know, and don't also be overconfident. Don't be it, it scares people away from you. Don't be overconfident. You know, and be vulnerable if you have to. Thank you. I think we'll stop there and uh, take some of uh, the questions and get some of the panelists to uh, answer. Isaac, would you like to start first and uh, respond to the questions put to you? There were some questions about um, uh, how many people have been ID'd in, identified in Kenya uh, as persons with albinism. There were comments about creating confidence in the albinism community and if there are any other uh, uh, resources that you're uh, working with or that uh, is going to come out of the, the pageant that you've been organizing. Um, and after you've gone, we'll pass uh, the mic back over to uh, Cora. Thank you, Leo. Um, uh, let me first be begin by the issue from my friend from Ghana. Yes, my, my father left. But I can tell you, I've gotten a report that he really regrets nowadays. <laughs> yeah, in fact, this, this mother, my mother will not tell me, but at some point he actually wanted to approach my mother and they get back together. But of course, surely, that's very opportunistic, so that, that's, that's what's under the bridge. And I have never met him, and I have very mixed feelings of when I, if I was to ever meet him. But people know about him. Uh, but funny enough, because we were dis dis discussing this with Jake, uh, about forming a wider coalition, just not just on albinism, but people with hypopigmentation, so people with vitiligo. You know, it's interesting that uh, his own mother actually got vitiligo, so she has become very white, if you like, like us, the way it looks. So it's, it's funny how sometimes if you call it karma, it happens. But then we, we don't wish anybody anything like that. But we, 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 are, we are a good example of demonstrating how you can waste your resource don't empower people with albinism. Now, on the statistics, um, we did not get um, persons with albinism in the, in the census register. We did not succeed. What we did is that there was, the, for the first time, there was a question on disability. And then we were told, we, were told we came too late, which I don't agree. Uh, but then we, the, 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 the enumerators, in their notes, they were told in the other, there was a box for other types of disability that they should consider albinism there. So out of that, the extrapolation is that we are about 65,000 in Kenya. However, uh, that is disputable, of course. Um, the, what we did with our program for sunscreen distribution, we wrote a position paper, as albinism sort of Kenya, to the government, where we initially suggested that 2,500 uh, beneficiaries uh, per month should be given a bottle of sunscreen. This number has since risen to 3,190. So this is the official uh, database of people that we have in Kenya that we even have an SMS system that we communicate with. Um, so, so those are, the, if you like, the official statistics. But it must be reminded, uh, to, by, uh, it must be borne by all of us that the issue of people with albinism is not about numbers. Because when you make it number, it also borders on being political. Uh, it's about the individual lives. It's about that individual who is suffering because on account of albinism. And if it was one Kenyan uh, with albinism, they deserve to be listened to. Um, Brian, uh, I see I, uh, somebody who is like a young Mugabe in you. I think uh, you are quite political. You should be a future MP in Zimbabwe. Now, the mandate of the Mr. and Ms. Albinism, you, when you win a pageant, then you, you get to get, you have the mandate. The mandate is on the, uh, promoting the rights of children with albinism. So we are still configuring that uh, with the manager, uh, with the manager of Mr. and Ms. Albinism. Uh, so that they can be going to schools and, you know, using such opportunities uh, to, 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 to advocate uh, for the rights of children with albinism for the, for the whole of this uh, year until next year when we have another one. And we, of course, would love to partner with anyone who would help us to do that in terms of awareness creation. We, the Mr. and Ms. Albinism uh, contest is actually a project under our uh, awareness creation initiative called Nikon Haki Campaign, which we move around uh, the, the country to create awareness, which, of course, we also want to partner. Uh, with, with people. Uh, so we expect that then by the time they finish that mandate, we will, we will have, you know, you know elevated the, the status of the rights of children with albinism and also brought on board more partners in that regard. Now, Jake Pele, allow me to comment on what you just said. It was not directed to me. <coughs> but there's something I've noted, Leon. 
And this maybe applies to all people who are considered to be marginalized. People will actually discriminate against you when they realize you are too good. When you tell it to them in their face, they'll find a way of shoving you off down the throat. And they will even be resistant to your suggestions. One, because they think you are too intelligent to be a person with albinism. You are too focused, you are too confident. We must not accept. They may do away with Isaac today, but other Isaacs will be inspired and move on and confront that stigma. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Isaac. Uh, Cora, there was a question uh, for you uh, about what kind of uh, research you did, you did into cultural attitudes before you shot your pro project in Senegal. And I'm wondering if you can actually touch a bit on the differences between uh, how you approached the project in Senegal versus the one that you did in South Africa, and what those differences were and how they informed your work. Thank you. So. <clears throat> Um, so I, I would like to say that when I did the first project in Senegal, actually, um, I was working with a, a journalist, a colleague, which is currently working for a national Senegalese newspaper. And you know, when you do a project, there is always the before the project, during the project, and after the project. So before the project, I think I have to say something which is very important. Um, we try to to do research about what we're going to talk about. And um, we, th we try to find, um, yeah, we try to find information about people living with albinism in Senegal, and especially in this region, in Tambacounda, because it's one of the hottest in Senegal. And I have to tell you that we struggle to find information. Um, there is a lack of information. So we went there and um, what we found in this region. <laughs> so we find very high temperature. We went there in winter and the temperature was around 40 degrees. It was winter and we find poverty and <laughs> We find um, people um, who don't have access to education, which is right, uh, which is a universal, a universal right, actually. We find very difficult stories. I can tell you some of the stories. Um, so we went to a, a family in a little villages. So to go there also, um, transportation, you have to walk, you have to walk and the sun is very hot, so you have to walk to go there and there is a family with a little kid and this little kid is eight years old and he, he has never been to school and actually the, the father of the family told us that I can say also that there is a lack of education and understanding and all of that. So the, the, the father told us that they are very, very concerned about um, this little kid and they understand that the, the son is, is, um, is um, how can I, is, is yeah, it's burning, it's, it's, yeah. So what they did is that all the family, then they did economy, they put a little bit of money to, to buy a solar cream for this kid. And when you see where the family is living, actually, it's painful, like very painful. But you can see that they are caring about this kid. And the, 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 the sad part of the story is that the, this, they told us that this kid um, developed an allergy to the cream that they, they, they buy, actually. So we don't know if it's because the cream was not good enough or if but you know that's the kind of thing that we were exposed. So um, yeah. So um, there is another story also that I, I think I should t tell you. It's more about false beliefs, and we spend all the afternoon in a, another family. The mother is alone to raise um, seven uh, kids because the father actually passed away. The 
the year before, and they are sleeping in one room. They are sharing the same bed. And so she said that she's um, selling, I don't know, uh, it's like a cereal, it's like Senegalese cereal um, to, to raise their, um, her kids. And, and we spend time with one of, so one of, of them, because actually, I think it's also, you know, it's not, it was very difficult because it was not just, we were not there to do a catalog of people living with albinism. So it's also considering the family around and, and actually the other kids that are also suffering, they are also living in poverty. So, um, and so we spend time with one of, so the, the, there is a, a, a little girl, she's going to secondary school and so she's 12 years old, and we spent time with her during all the afternoon, and she didn't want to talk to us. She said she, she, she was very shy, and actually you, you saw some, one of the pictures of her when she's looking at her hands. And she was very shy, she didn't want to share anything with us, so we just spent time, and at the end of the afternoon, because we also have to manage our time, and we just say, okay, we're gonna leave you, but thank you for, sharing some time with us and she said no she said no stay and she because my colleague was asking her um, how is it for you when you go to school and she never answered to this question and when we leave she said no come and she started to talk and she said that every day when she's going to school the other um, uh, kids in the in her class are splitting on her because they believe that if they split on her, uh, they're not gonna have um, a child with albinism in their own family. So, yeah, uh, I can say in Seneca it was very sad, and I'm actually, I am very, I think it's a very important to, to give a, a positive message, but sometimes, you know, you, you are just confronting, you are just confronting uh, in front of something that you just can't give a positive message. That's what it is, and you just try to manage your emotion and try to be, to stay professional, to to put your try to put your emotion in your work and try to do something with it. But actually, when I now <laughs> when I came in South Africa, I find I ask myself this kind of question and also about representation. And yeah, it's poverty, it's sad, and it's actually for me, it's actually what happened, what I saw. But there is also, sometimes you can also find some other people um, and you will see confidence and you will see a positive message and something that you want to, you want to show that yes, we also, there is also another point of view on, on the story and, and there is also another, um, there, sorry, I'm, I'm thinking in French sometimes, and I'm trying to to follow in English. So. <laughs> but yeah, so it's completely two different approach. And I think, okay, I I don't know if you saw well the picture, but with the Senegalese project, even in the in the approach, like photographically, it it looks old. It looks um, almost like paintings, like something, you know. And in the in the the project that I did this year, actually, I, and I was not even thinking about doing this project. It's, I think it's because of the, the meeting with Gloria, because of this relationship that I was like, okay, I should, I should maybe try to continue. And, and she brings something different, so that's why I, I continue. Um, but it's something more, more, more young, more dynamic, and 